Do you like that? Good morning, everyone. It's time for announcements. I have a list. Um, I'm going to ask you all probably to add to it as you see fit. I don't see Liz's name in here yet, but maybe somebody else can help me out with the bulbs. Uh, next weekend, after service, from noon to 2, we're going to be having Trunk or Treat. Jen, you want to raise your hand? Jen Sandoval is organizing that. We have a good number of people signed up to do a trunk. Y'all are doing a trunk, right? Who else doing a trunk? I'm doing a trunk. It's going to be cute. So there are going to be kids running around in costumes, picking up candy and, and other um, treats. So that will be here in the parking lot. Jen, what do you want to say? OK, Jan just, Jen just let me know that if uh, we are receiving, we are accepting donations of Halloween candy, if you feel like contributing, as well as small toys for those children with food allergies, um, so that we can ensure they have some fun too. There is a big orange bin right back by the welcome table. Um, and I assume we'll be receiving those throughout the week. So if, if anybody wants to come by and drop those off, um, uh, we'd appreciate that. The ground floor is in need of some warm winter clothes as we move into the wet, cool months. One thing I know from my time at Northwest Youth Services is that even if young people get a nice set of warm pants or gloves or socks once, by the end of the week, those are wet and soiled and no longer any good to them. Um, so they need sort of ongoing support with maintaining particularly uh, foot health, so warm socks. Uh, good shoes, uh, but also, you know, weatherproof jackets uh, are always very helpful. Um, and I haven't talked with the ground floor about any specific needs, but just that's just based on my experience there. Anti-racism series is ongoing. The next one will be on November 14th. Uh, I don't have a time for that, uh, and I don't see Sharon Camblin, but I'll just say that uh, they're going to be talking about Thanksgiving, right? A uh, complicated subject for those of us who are trying to lean into the truth of you know, an oppressive, violent history for our indigenous friends um, and, and figure out how we move forward um, as people who've been taught certain stories about Thanksgiving. How can we do this in a way that holds integrity? Right? So we'll be having more conversations about that. I want to tell you about an opportunity coming up this coming week. I will be out of town at a prevention conference in Spokane. Um, otherwise, I would be eager to organize a team to go. But Doctober um, on Tuesday is featuring a film called 1946, The Mistranslation That Shifted Culture. Jeff, you know about this a little bit? Yeah, so it's a, it's a documentary about some mistranslations of the Bible that led to the persecution of LGBTQ folks and how those mistranslations have been used over time. Um, and I think there's some scholars weighing in as well as people with lived LGBTQ experience. I wish I could go, but I highly recommend it. That's at 2.45 on Tuesday. Uh, are we still collecting jackets? No, is that over with? Yes? Fantastic. OK, so we are still doing the jacket drive, the warm uh, coat drive. So that's um, great. Um, I also wanted to say that we have a meal train going on for our beloved Eliza and Theo. Since we didn't get to celebrate them originally when Theo was born, now we get to show up uh, for Eliza with some meals. You can find more information about that in the Friday announcements email. I have a fun announcement. Oh, oh, also, next Thursday um, at about 5.30, we're going to be doing another 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. gathering. I'd just like everybody to feel invited to this space, regardless of your age, though there won't be child care. Um, and we'll be back at Elizabeth Station. You can get good pizza and snacks there as well as um, beer and non-alcoholic beverages too. Um, I've not sent that email out yet, but I will. I also just want to make a, a joyful announcement since so many of you have asked, I have a well that's functioning, and we are laundering everything in the house. <laughs> so, which is good, because grandma's potty training. Um, that's what I have. 
Um, there was also an announcement from Liz uh, Stamen about bulbs for next weekend. I know that we are going to be planting bulbs during the service and maybe after the service. Uh, and I think the invitation was that if you have some bulbs, some flower bulbs, irises, daffodils, crocus, at home that you think need to be divided, this is a fantastic opportunity to go ahead and dig those up, dry those off this week, and bring them with you next week to plant around um, the church building. So that will be part of our service next week. Does anyone else have an important announcement? Yes. All right. Oh, hey, Brennan, welcome. Good to see you and your family. Hey, Mary, I think it's time. I think we're good. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> One more minute. Okay. We'll let a few more folks trickle in here. Good morning, good morning. Sharon is obviously away today. She's visiting her parents in Pennsylvania. All right, let's do it. Hey, Josh. Will you have Isa please ring that bell? Yes. for our daughter, Mari, who grew up and was baptized in church. Yeah, that's so great. That's all. Do you want me to add that to the, to the sure. community Yeah, thing? people know. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Bellingham. My name is Paige. My pronouns are she and they. If you have questions about that, I'm happy to share. Good to see you, Roger. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Thank you for making us whole with your presence. Let us worship. The text for this morning comes from a, a Psalm 139. I know I told you a few weeks ago that we are moving through the narrative lectionary. I'm cheating today. The text for today was going to be the coronation of David, and I said to Sharon last week, do I really have to preach that? It's my last sermon. And she said, no, you preach whatever you want. So I think it was David who said, I got a dispensation from on high to preach whatever I wanted this morning. There are a lot of different types of psalms in our text. Lately, I think we've been reading a lot of psalms of lament, right? There's a lot to lament right now, a lot of grief in our hearts. Today, I chose a text of praise, a text of joy a text that is about communication and relationship between humans and God. When I read the Bible, I don't read the list of do's and don'ts that I was taught as a child. I read stories of our collective history. I read not about fact, but about truth, about things that were important to our ancestors in the faith, that they so much wanted their children and their children's children to know. And sometimes I think about how they would never have even imagined that we all would be sitting around here so many hundreds, thousands even years later, pondering these same texts, mining them for wisdom, consolation, mining them for guidance. And there are so many times when we need to dig inside and ask difficult questions. One, this is one of those times. I was talking with so many people this week about how we feel caught in this tension. That we feel this uh, 
pull, right? That if we say, oh my gosh, our hearts just ache for what we saw happen in Israel, those innocent people wounded, that we are called anti-Palestinian. And if we weep for the children and people of Gaza and we say, they need help, this has to stop, then we are called anti-Israel or anti-Semitic. This is a tough time to be alive. Instead of digging into some of those difficult questions today, as my last chance to preach to all of you, to share in this space, I wanted to instead to find a text about God's love for us, to take a breather, to take a beat, to step back from the challenges of the world today and all of the weight that we carry all the time and just set it down, get a little oxytocin going and bask. Bask in the goodness of this space. Bask in the goodness that we can still find out in the world, in the beauty of nature, in the goodness of one another, and most importantly, in the goodness of God. So I invite you into that space with me today. Amen. Oh, yes. It's the page show today. And now is the time with children. Children, will you come forward? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, I love kids, but um, it's teenagers who come naturally to me, not these little ones. So instead of a sermon today, I've decided to read a really wonderful book. And Sharon, you may know, is really all about the copyright situation. So I just went ahead and emailed this fella, and he's like, yes, please, use the book. So we'll be reading a book today. Hi, sweet Theo. Hi, friends. Everybody get comfortable. We're going to read a story. Children, children at heart, anybody who wants to hear a story, come on forward. Hey, Brennan. Hi, little ones. I just want to say before we read this story that it brings me so much joy to see you all. You are such a gift to us. We love hearing you play, hearing your voices, seeing your sweet faces as you grow. Thank you for being here. All right. Look at this. We're clapping for you. OK, team, I'm going to try to make sure everybody gets to see the pictures. You, you, when God made you, God made you all shiny and new, an incredible you. A you all your own, a you unlike anyone else ever known. An exclusive design, one God refined, you're perfectly crafted, one of a kind. Because when God made you, somehow God knew that the world needed someone exactly like you. You, you, God thinks about you. God was thinking of you long before your debut. That means your arrival. From the very beginning, amid history and time, you, little one, never left God's mind. God imagined your eyes, your head's shape and size, and knew what you'd look like when you felt surprised. Can you show me your surprise face? <laughs> God pictured your nose and all your ten toes, or how many you have. The sound of your voice, God had it composed. The lines on your hands, your hair, every strand, God knew every detail like it was all planned. Out of billions of faces from cultures, all races, people God made from all different places, God knew your name. Your picture is framed. God's family without you would not be the same. Because when God made you, this much is true. The world got to meet who God already knew. You, you, when God sees you, God delights in what is and sees only what's true. That you, yes you, in all of your glory, bring color and rhythm and rhyme to God's story. So be you, fully you, a show-stopping review. Live your life in full color, every tint, every hue. 
Discover, explore, have faith, but love more, and learn and relearn that God, what God made you for. Use your talents and passions, those gifts that God fashioned. Think up ideas, and then put them to action. Because God loves you creating, your true self displaying, when you make believe the stories conceived, the heroics, the magic, those tricks up your sleeve. When you dance alone, spinning like a cyclone, being whoever, whatever, in a world all your own, God smiles, and here's why. In the spark of your eye, a familiar reflection shines bright from inside. What do you think that spark is? That's God inside you. Because when God made you and the world oohed and odd, in heaven they called you the image of God. You all are the image of God. You, you, when God dreams about you, God dreams about all that in you will be true. That you, God's you, will be hopeful and kind, a giver who lives with all heart, soul, and mind. A dreamer who dreams in big and small themes, who keeps dreaming in journeys upstream. Ooh, a mover, a shaker, a lover of nature. You see that pretty colorful picture? Yeah. A builder of bridges. You, the peacemaker. Are you peacemakers? Yeah. Yes, you are peacemakers. A you who views others as sisters and brothers and more and lives by three words, love one another. A confident you, strong and brave too. You being you is God's dream coming true. Because when God made you, all of heaven was beaming over you, God was smiling and already dreaming. What do you think? What does this book tell you? Uh, about God and what else? You know what it tells me? It tells me that each and every one of you is loved. You're unique. All of the things that are hard for you and all of the things that come natural to you are good. And you are important to God and God's community, and you are important to this community. And without each and every one of you, we would be incomplete. All right. Who's ready for Children's Church? Me. Me. Okay. If you're ready to go to Children's Church, you can follow Josh. If you'd like to stay with your parents, you can do that too. Or your grown ups. Thank you, everyone. I have crab too. I'm crab. You're a crab? God made crabs, too. We got a crab walker. <laughs> I do that on my microphone.
Good morning. My name is David Faram, and I would like you to please rise in body or spirit as you're able and join me in the call to worship. Listen. Listen for the voice of God naming us all. Holy, beloved, cherished, valued. We believe you delight in us. Make us people who recognize and proclaim your beauty and goodness in unexpected places. Challenge us, transform us. We trust in you, Holy One, to reveal to us the sacredness of every life, of every way of being, of every physical manifestation of your spirit. May it be so. Well, that was a fun song. Thank you, Judy. So we're turning to a time of community prayer, and I'm eager to hear from you your joys and concerns this morning. What do you want to bring to the community in prayer? Yes, Lori. Okay, um, I'm Lori Hoyt, and I'd like to bring, have us bring prayers to Gail Kimball, whose 97th birthday was Friday, and he entered the hospital, and uh, Next steps are being considered by my husband, Rob, and the hospitalist, and uh, we spoke with John Green this morning, and so I'll speak with Sharon this afternoon. So prayers for Dale. Kimmel. Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. So uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, prayers for Dale Kimball. Friday was his 97th birthday, and he went into the hospital that day. And so there are some important decisions that need to be made about next steps, and those folks closest to him, Rob, um, John, um, and some others will be gathering together to help make those plans. Who else has a care to bring to the community? Jeff, yes. Yes, as some of you know, my mother uh, died peacefully on Monday, October the 2nd. And I'm just asking for prayers for my family and myself 
Uh, and as many of you know, grief is a long-term journey. Yes. And so it's uh, filled with a lot of fits and starts, mm -hmm. uh, filled with agony and heartbreak, and also love and gratitude. So we're just asking for, I'm asking for prayers on behalf of my family in this time of transition. Thank you, Jeff. So as many of you may know, Jeff's mother passed away peacefully on October 2nd. And Jeff is just asking for prayers for the family as they live through together these waves of grief um, and enjoying the joyful memories as well as, as profound loss. Thank you, Jeff. We've been thinking of you and praying for you. Who else has a prayer? Yes, Margie. Okay. Um, and during the journey with his family there, one, uh, one of his children has moved back from college and one of his uh, children is at Seton Hall still. Okay. And so they're, um, they're mm. navigating that journey and the students and the staff, they're sending good, good vibes and, and such, but a love to you guys all. Okay, great. Thank you. So Jim Zercher, a, a Whatcom Middle School teacher, um, is entering hospice care. Okay, thank you. Yes, Carol. Continued prayers for Kathleen McGinnis. She got through her surgery, but she's got a road ahead of her. And so continued okay. prayers for Kathleen and her healing. Okay, thank you. Yes. Prayers for Vicki Wakachaw, whose mother died this last week oh, after 15 years of having Alzheimer's. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hal Roberts. Hal Roberts? Yes, we, he was taken to the hospital last night. Okay. I don't know exactly at this point what has happened. They were talking maybe a stroke. So. Okay, so Hal Roberts was taken to the hospital last night. We're not sure what happened that could have Long been a stroke. Longtime member here. Longtime member, thank you. Yes. Um, prayers for our daughter, Mari Weprecht, who lives in Baltimore. She is very, very sick and praying that the doctors can figure out what's wrong with her. I'm flying there Tuesday to be with her. So. Okay. Prayers for her and safe travels for me. Okay, thank you. So Mari is, uh, is very sick. Um, so the mother's gonna be flying to Baltimore tomorrow, or this week rather. So prayers for Mari that the doctors can find out what's going on um, and prayers for safe travels. Other joys or concerns to lift up? Yes. Prayers for Dave Hoffer, who is having very complex heart surgery this week. Okay. At St. Joe's. Okay. Prayers for Dave Hoffer, who's having very complex heart surgery this week at St. Joe's. Yes. I have a prayer of thanking. My sister and I went to Chico, California for my birthday. We had wonderful travel and wonderful times with my Tennessee family and my Chico family. It was really a praise. For the Fantastic. Family. So Judith and Barb went to Chico, California for, Bar for Judith's birthday. And they just had a wonderful time, uh, safe travels, spent time with family, both from Tennessee and from Chico. Fantastic, so good to hear that. Yes. Just a, a note of gratitude. Um, over the last several weeks, we've seen an extraordinary amount of music come through the Bellingham community. Mm -hmm. From the Bellingham Celtic Festival to last weekend's Bellingham Exit Festival. There was a night of gypsy jazz last night with both Seattle and Bellingham musicians. And to be able to come here and listen to Judy and mm -hmm. look forward to the Handbell Choir, mm -hmm. uh, just in gratefulness for that human activity that lifts us all up. Wonderful. So a celebration and gratitude for the amazing music that's been coming through town lately that we've had the chance to enjoy and the way that it lifts us up. Yes, Nancy. I am also filled with gratitude for Paige. This is her last sermon. <laughs> so much grace. So much grace. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer. Loving God, we would ask for you to draw near to us and to fill this space, but we know, we bear witness to the truth that you are already here. You reside in every heart. You dwell 
within and between us. The children bring us so much joy seeing these sweet incarnations of you. Thank you, God, for this sacred space we can turn to every week to set down the busyness of life and turn to stillness, turn to community, turn to beauty through music, words. God, we are a grateful, humble people. We have so many cares on our hearts this morning of members, family members, who we want to hold up to you. We know you are with them already. And we know that prayer is powerful. God, we hold up Dale Kimball and all the people who are making decisions regarding his care, that you would give them wisdom, guidance, make a way. For Kathleen McGinnis, who's recovering from back surgery, for Jim Zercher, who's in hospice, for Hal Roberts, for George, who has third degree burns from a welding accent, for Mari, and for all the other unspoken prayers of people living with illness, facing uncertainty, worrying about the impact on family and caregivers, God, tend to them all. Be a comfort. Provide healing in however you know is best for them. God, we give thanks today as well. We give thanks for birthday celebrations that can be spent with family. We give thanks for travel. We give thanks for music and art and gatherings for documentaries that tell truths, for children's books. We give thanks for children. God, we would be remiss if we did not hold up all the children of the world. Those children living under the weight of human violence in its many forms if you cannot reach over them and protect them, then at least, God, give them some sort of imaginary world where they can escape and find your consolation. Give them refuge within or without. Give us wisdom to know what we can do, what words, what actions, what donations will have an impact. If nothing else, let us be a witness to finding a third way of taking only the side of love, taking only the side of freedom, only the side of mercy, God. Let us be known as a people of light. Beloveds, will you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture this morning comes from Psalm 139. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me, I can't reach it. 
Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you'd be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me. Even then, the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine as bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together when I was still in my mother's womb. I give you thanks that I was marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in a secret place, when I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my embryo, and your scroll every day was written that, and on your scroll every day was written that was being formed in me, before any one of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I tried to count them, they outnumber the grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I would still be with you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Amen. Thanks be to God. Last week after service, Mary showed me where the conductor's platform was. <laughs> so now when I preach, I'm not just staring at the microphone here. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Loving God, what a gift to gather in the safety and comfort of this space. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your eyes, my comfort, my way maker. Amen. The first time I saw Fern, we were in a dimly lit ultrasound room off of Northwest Avenue. Ed Sheeran was playing over the sounds of the clinic. I think we were at the 10-week mark. I'd actually seen the blob of cells, the embryo that would become Fern, the day that she was implanted in my wife's womb. They gave us a photo. See, we received the donation of embryos from a family in Portland. They'd gone through the IVF process, had three children, and still had remaining viable embryos. So we reached out to them and we signed a contract and we took possession of four frozen potential children two of which became our kids. I just have to say, it's a really cool way to build a family. <laughs> yeah, and these other children are like cousins, and now we have this extended aunts and uncles, and we spend holidays and, you know, vacations together. It's wonderful. Anyway. The day of that first ultrasound, I was really excited. It was early December, and I was eager to get a picture to use to surprise our family of this great news at Christmas. They didn't know what we were up to. And I guess I was a little nervous. I was nervous that we might learn there was something wrong. It turns out, for the process entirely, I was completely unprepared. Kristen was laying there, and we were all looking at the screen when Fern came into focus. Maybe I was still expecting a blob, but what came into view looked a lot more like a baby. And its heart was beating a mile a minute. I burst into tears, and that was it. That one glimpse, and maybe a little Ed Sheeran, was all it took. <laughs> I became a parent in that moment. From then on, I was a nervous wreck. 
worried something would go wrong. I already loved her. In my work, I talk a lot about how we attribute gendered behaviors and characteristics to little children from the time they're tiny, before they can tell us anything about who they are. So I knew enough to know that I didn't yet know Fern. All I knew was that this child was ours. Being a parent has brought many things into view for me. That's not the only way to come to clarity, but it's worked for me. It's also brought me a lot of healing. I don't love Fern because of who she is, as wonderful as she may be, or because of what she does or might someday do. Sure, I feel a lot of affection for her uniqueness, tenderness to her sensitive, shy ways, admiration for her courage, her courage and curiosity. But that's not why I love her. I love her simply because she exists, because she is. Loving Fern and Graham has helped me better understand the nature of God's love for us. We live our days out in a world that has strict rules about who is worthy of love and acceptance and who is not. There are so many pressures to become someone or something we are not just to please others, to earn acceptance, to satisfy that fundamental need to belong. And there are many things we do for ourselves and for the sake of others that are wholly worthy to those ends. We try to eat well and exercise. We make sacrifices and change our habits to cause less harm to the environment. We pass on the vacation or the fancy pair of shoes because we've already budgeted that money for others. We tend to our mental health, take quiet time, see a therapist, meditate. I could go on. Maybe some things have come to mind for you, choices you make intentionally to care for yourself and others. But then there's the other stuff. Much of this other stuff exists outside of our awareness, the things we do sometimes without even meaning to, without realizing what's happening, to earn our acceptance, to prove our worthiness, things we do in order to be loved. I don't know anyone who grew into adulthood without some kind of message about what they needed to do or be in order just to be okay. A lot of that comes from our family of origin, and a lot of it comes from the world around us. I used to work with a young adult who I love and admire, and by the time they were in high school, they knew they wanted to do a PhD. Their parents really valued education, and from the time uh, this young person was much smaller, they had been praised for their smarts and hard work. After college, they were still on this highly detailed plan toward a PhD. Everything was lining up just right, but then something happened. They had enough distance from their parents and enough experience out there in the world beyond the academy to realize, maybe I don't want to do a PhD. Maybe I never wanted to. Maybe something else was at work in me. I know I've had moments like that, when I realized that 10 years in wealth management was just a desperate and vain attempt to prove that I was worthy because I worked in a fancy industry. Yes, I spent 10 years in wealth management or even how I spent months trying to get all the weeds out of my gravel driveway when I knew that my uncle, who was so important to me, might stop by my adult home for the first time ever, or the ways I betrayed myself to get the attention of other women before I met my wife, Kristen, or even now, the ways I think about the size of my body with both shame and arrogance. Do you know that in 2022, the weight loss industry was brushing up against $136 billion? And the beauty market is another 43 billion. I know that some folks love exercise and fashion, and I think that's fantastic, but I don't think that that's what's behind these astronomical numbers. I see a desire to be enough. Fit enough, thin enough, beautiful enough, worthy, lovable. And hear me clearly when I say that there is nothing wrong whatsoever with the desire to be worthy, to belong, to be loved. That desire is healthy and good. Here's the thing I really want you to hear. God loves you simply because you exist. There is nothing you need to do, indeed nothing you can do, to belong, to earn God's love, you are, so it is. 
For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I know that full well. I can just imagine a tender, loving God with her gentle hands shaping fern like a potter, cradling her tiny embryo and God's fingers, breathing the breath of life into fern's nostrils. I can imagine God bursting into tears at the sight of Fern, like a smitten new parent who asks nothing back, only delights in her very existence. In his book, Healing Resistance, Kazu Haga writes, agape love is unconditional love for all of humanity, for all of life on earth, for all that exists in the cosmos. It's what Dr. King called disinterested love, because you have no interest in whether the object of your agape love loves you back or not. He goes on, you do not have agape love for someone because of all the experiences that you've been through together. You do not have agape love for someone because of the things they do for you. You do not have agape love for them because of the ways they make you feel. You love them simply because they exist. You love them because you acknowledge a sanctity that exists deep in the souls of all people. This is how God loves. Now, it's one thing to hear that we are loved. It's another to feel it. So how does God's love show up for us? How does God's love show up for you, I wonder? In a moment of transcendent peace on a quiet morning, as you watch the sunrise? Is it that feeling of ease you have when you're with your best friend or your closest family member? Is it in the way someone came to your side in the middle of a hard time without asking to intrude in just the way you needed? Has God's love shown up for you in your vocation, whether that was the vocation of raising a family or one outside the home? Kristen's out of town, and Fern has a habit of crawling into my bed in the morning when Kristen's out of town. His sweet little body I woke up to her warm beside me, her chilly feet on my side. What? No, it was good, because I have hot flashes. (laughs) (laughs) Started way earlier than I thought. And um, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so sweet. It's all of that, right? It's all of that and more, and we all experience it differently. Every time we see justice being done, oppression being overturned, people turning up to love one another well, that is God's love being made known and real to us. That is the love of God shining forth through God's people. This is my last sermon during my time as your sabbatical pastor. I'll be here next week, but Sharon will be preaching. I want you to know that I'm deeply and profoundly grateful to have spent these last three months with you. Being part of this community, getting to know you, seeing glimpses of your lives, being trusted with your stories, it's been a huge gift. I have felt caught, not in the stuck way, but in the kept from falling way. I didn't know I was falling, but you all reached out and caught me nonetheless. I don't talk about this much, especially in public, but a couple of years, I went through a very painful experience. My values, the worth of my role in our larger community, my place of belonging among beloved colleagues was all thrown into doubt by someone powerful in our community, someone who hardly knew me. I lost a lot. I've come to understand what happened there, and I'm not dragging that story around like I once did. I've done a lot to heal but I didn't know that I needed you. There was more healing, healing I couldn't give myself, healing I couldn't do even in the therapist's office. I needed to be embraced and appreciated. I needed to be trusted and believed. And that's what you all have done for me. You've helped me see myself more clearly again. You've held up a mirror and said, we love you. You all have been a powerful force for God's love in my life. Thank you for just your being you, for the ways you've built 
and maintain this space, this community, so that someone like me could show up thinking I'd offer something of myself, but instead walk away knowing better about the gift of beloved community, about agape love. I'd like to leave you with the words of Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Amen. This morning, we're going to have our first creation care ritual. Testimony followed by dropping a marble in a container records our commitment to our common home. Listen to the witnessing. Listen to the sound of the marble as it plunks. Now you may be wondering, why a marble? The iconic 1972 Blue marble photograph 
taken by Apollo 17, sparked the need for sustainable development to care for our planet. The image quickly became a symbol of the early environmental movement and was adopted by activist groups such as Friends of the Earth and annual events such as Earth Day. And now, let us begin. Created in the image of God, we are called to care for creation in ways large and small, to celebrate the actions of our community towards a sustainable and just future for all. We are blessed by stories and symbols of ongoing work for creation, justice, and our commitment to God's future. I promise to use my voice <clears throat> and write to all my state legislators beginning in January of 2024 when the session begins again. I will use my energy to encourage support of legislation that protects the environment. In addition, I will use my shopping cart if I need to buy more than my backpack allows. Cans are heavy. I choose to do this even though it will take more time than if I just did a quick drive to Hagen's. I want to reduce my use of fossil fuel. And even though I will realize I will look like an old lady with a shopping cart, perhaps the idea will catch on. I know that my faith calls me to action. Excuse me. I'm uh, Larry Meninga, and um, I make it one of my aims in life it, to reduce my contribution to, uh, to f the use of fossil fuels and, and reduction in greenhouse gases. I'm a member of the Solar Committee here at church. Your donations have made it possible for us to put solar panels on the roof of part of the roofs of our buildings. Uh, those solar panels produce 40, around 43,000 kilowatt hours of energy per year, energy coming from the sun rather than the burning of fossil fuels. So that also contributes to the reduction of greenhouse gases. I am the same way of feeling that I needed to do something and I feel so overwhelmed with this issue as well as a lot of others. And I decided, uh, I got an idea from Beth Hawthorne about getting buying a laundry rack to dry my clothes and let my dryer sit without using any electricity. So I may basically use my uh, rack now and some of the, um, someone on the green team had mentioned well, maybe um, you can consider that a, a spiritual practice. And I thought, you know, at first I thought, you know, I'm not sure draping my wet laundry across a rack is really a spiritual practice, but it's come to be that and, and because it slows me down and I think about what I have, all the clothes I have and all that I have, and I take time to do that. It takes a little more time, obviously, to dry, and the towels are stiffer like they were when they used to hang in the sun outside. I don't have a, uh, out, I have an apartment, no place to hang outside. And um, I do it intentionally, and I think that's what makes it a spiritual practice. And now, friends, be alert to Mission Mondays the messages that come on Mondays from the church. Perhaps you too will want to witness in the next coming months. And will you please join us now 
with the creation care prayer. You will read with me the words in all caps, and Larry and Gail will read the rest of the text. Creator God, who multiplies blessings, bless these symbols and the actions, actions they represent as we join with you to heal and protect our planet from pollution and destruction. Help us to set, to set aside the desire for material riches, opening our hearts to the myriad life forms around us and the rich beauty of this planet that we hold dear. Guide us as we, as we learn to make sustainable changes in our everyday lives. And bless the scientists, researchers, activists, and advocates for climate justice as they multiply the blessings we offer. We pray in awe of the life and the beauty on this planet that we call home. Amen. Beloved, go from this place knowing that you were knit together by the hand of God, intentionally shaped into just exactly who you are, and that there's nothing you need to do or do differently to be cherished, to be precious, to be lovable. Go in peace. Amen.